you've probably heard a lot about this different strategy or this different strategy or this really cool curriculum or, or here's some, some games and stuff you can play. The question now is how do you put it into place when you actually go back to school and how do you effectively do it in a manner that it's going to really change instruction. So uh, Tawana kind of gave a little bit of an introduction for us. Uh, my name is Brian Seymour. I am the Director of Instructional Technology for Pickerton Schools. Um, a former science teacher, former curriculum coordinator, so I kind of have that different path of a tech director. So I really look at technology more in, in a learning, uh, teaching and learning view than an actual technology view for us. And we put down some of our uh, Twitter accounts and things like that. Yeah, and so I've known now Brian for I think about five years. Uh, we actually are friends and colleagues, it's kind of nice, and I will say having to, had an opportunity to work with them as an instructional technology integrated leader of a district is a unique role. Usually there's an IT department segregated from an instructional department. He kind of blends that, that gap there, and in, in 21st century schools, that's a, we need that in districts, and that's, it, it was great to experience that with him, and I've tried to do as best I can in my, in my, in my current district. Um, so yeah, there's my information. I will just say this, I'm a principal in, in Ohio. I am not a Buckeye. I'm born and raised in Knoxville, Tennessee, so go Vols. And uh, <laughs> this is my first time being in the great state of California. So thank you for having me here. And hopefully Brian and I can come at it from different angles, but um, the same end results of just you know, trying to in innovate and inspire and engage uh, kids uh, for our, our, our culture and society's future. So one of the things with blended learning that I always find is really hard is defining what blended learning means. We could probably go around the room and ask every single one of you and every single person would have a slightly different definition of what blended learning is. So what we're going to try to do over the course of the next 40 minutes or so is really define what we believe blended learning is and how it has effectively changed um, our, my school district and Brian's uh, home school. So a couple things that we believe in and a couple things that we feel that are myths of blended learning. So some of those include that the students are on the device 24-7. It's all about one-to-one -one devices. Blended learning was around way before there was even laptops in the schools and so on and so forth. Um, students complete assignments working primarily at home or at school. Um, online learning is for gifted students or credit recovery only. Blended learning is busy work or canned curriculum. It's easy for kids, at least at first. Um, and blended learning is a linear process. All miss. Yeah. Um, and so on the right hand side, by the way, this is all, a PowerPoint is all online too, so you don't feel like you have to write it down. Um, so on the right hand side, more myths. Uh, technology replaces the teacher, <laughs> that there's gonna be a robot, you know, for, you know, and, and teachers unions should be worried because they're gonna get replaced. Not so. Um, you know, because the human touch is always gonna be inter integral in, in education. Um, one digital tool will be enough, you know, one, one angle that you come at it with kids is going to be enough. I think throughout the lessons that we saw this morning, we can see you know, technology and other aspects of the human interactions and um, the, the hands-on approaches all need to be blended together. Um, students work on a device and then with a teacher. Um, students work in isolation. Blended learning is less work than traditional teaching methods. Uh, you know, you can work smarter, not harder, but it could be depending on the, the teacher's work ethic where they, where they want to be, but uh, this is not necessarily the case. Um, children lose creativity and critical thinking. I'm at a STEM school. I, I was at, um, I did STEM work in Columbus City Schools and then some at Pickerington, and now I'm at an elementary school, kindergarten through fourth grade, and STEM uh, with blended learning is magic, and, and I'll kind of talk through that on my, my story. Um, and technology decreases the human interaction, not so. This uh, next slide here, um, you can read it for yourself. I'm not going to read every word there. Uh, there's some anecdotal stories that I have, a couple, that Brian actually was in on some of these stories as well that we heard from different people who presented that I think framed um, Blended Learning's mythology and the problem uh, of how people may approach it. Um, and I just wanted to share a couple of those with you all so that way it's always good right to identify a problem and then try to have some solutions so everything else that you hear from here will be and as we rotate around you all will be hopefully engaging your heads what are some solutions that you have in your schools in your districts or wherever whatever capacities you work in um, I'm a big believer if you, you need to identify a takeaway for yourself in your profession I can't just give that to you so I'm gonna throw out some problems and then you can find and work a solution I, I, I think some of the things that Brian and I will share are solutions 
uh, but not the one necessarily solution. There's an education, um, there's a variety of things that we can come at um, to approach um, learning and in good teaching and hopefully you can figure out what makes the most sense for you in your district. Uh, just say a few things about my school. So I'm at a um, elementary school, kindergarten through fourth grade, 440 students, 71% economically disadvantaged, 71%, um, but we have the highest uh, in our district and in, really in our state early literacy program going on because um, we have awesome teachers who collaborate and work really well together. Um, we're a STEM school. It's our fourth year being identified as a STEM school and the teachers interviewed, re-interviewed to stay at this school. Um, it's a public school though. This is not a monastery, not to say that's not public. Um, it's not a, a, a lottery school. It's a school of choice. Parents have to select to be in our school, um, but they're not interviewed. They're neighborhood schools. They, it, it, there's an application that's really just put your, your address and your social security information and, and prove that you live somewhere in the vicinity and that you come to our school. Um, and we have about 40 uh, teachers and staff members. And so for me, it's very important to get key leaders in, in, when you go into a building on board and at least identify it. And so for me, I, I meet with, uh, I have a, I've identified a technology coordinator in my building and I have what's called STEM coordinators in my building. And we meet on a monthly basis, each of them different teams, um, to implement and think about strategies for our building. And then we share it out with um, the staff at different periods of time. We don't ever um, have st your traditional staff meetings in my, anymore. I don't do logistical staff meetings. I do all that through email or one-on-one -on -one communications. Our staff meetings are all professional development, all uh, high-level introductory of new concepts that they can implement in the classroom the next day. I don't waste the time with uh, what some teachers find as busy work that's enjoyable because it's consumable. Does that make sense? Like a t a, Think about yourself. You're going to sit through a meeting way easier if you can feel like you don't really have much to do and participate in but you just have to write down information and follow through. I try to push them to a kind of a, a, a spot where it's uncomfortable so they have to try things out in, in, the, in the classroom. Some things in my building that we do, um, all my evaluations of teachers include how they're incorporating st blended learning, STEM approach to learning and innovation. I have that in my uh, rubric that I ask. I have them show me their ST math pro syllabus progress. I know it, but I have them show it to me. Uh, we have other blended learning tools that we have as well that I hold them to. Um, teachers and leaders only implement what you, what you speak about, what you hold them accountable to. Um, I do a ton of, right here, called accountability high bar evaluations tied to innovative practice and spotlighting successful teaching. I do a ton of competitive, uh, culture building activities in, my, in our building. So I'll highlight, and I'll, by highlighting I mean I ask teachers to share out at different opportune times what they're doing in their classrooms so that way others can um, hear about it and ask questions about it too. But typically I'll do it multiple from each grade level. I won't just highlight one who's always doing great stuff. I'll try to do others as well and tell them what they're doing successfully. Teachers a lot of times don't identify that self-critique to know what they're doing successful. They need someone to spotlight it for them or provide opportunities that they can you know, try out something in their classroom. Another thing that we do in our building, we have student ambassadors. So in every classroom that you go into, these are young kids, there is a student who will greet a person at the door, walk them around what they're doing in the classroom, um, and share out some bullet points of what Blue learning is occurring, what projects they've been doing, and what skills they've been mastering lately. That's important. Skills they've been mastering. That's tied to standards. Um, that has been something that's, uh, that was, I have, when we have tours, we have about two a month, and we're talking from different schools, districts, teachers coming through, uh, different partnerships that we have for our building that come through, and then even parents who are interested in coming in my building bring their child through. That is the, the biggest, number one feedback is hearing kids explain their process. I heard Matthew say this morning, when someone's explained something, that's when they've mastered something, when they, when they can talk about it. That's when it's kind of transferable. Hearing kids talk about the innovative learning that's occurring in their classrooms um, is bar none the greatest thing. Um, but every time I can, I try to have kids speaking about what's going on in their educational practice at my school really wherever I've been. I think that's about all I need to say on that spot.
So here's kind of a shift for us in our building, the buildings I've been in. You've heard uh, the teacher as a sage on the stage kind of mentality that they have a lesson that they teach for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, depending on what upper grade levels you're in. Um, that is an antiquated uh, system of thinking of instruction. Um, I've heard it said, if you are, are going to direct instruct, I'm probably modeling it pretty poorly right now, you should do it every minute of the age of a child. So if you have first graders of, that are eight-year-old in your classroom, you should not teach for more than eight minutes directly. Does it make sense? If you have a classroom of 12-year-olds, 12 minutes is about your max of what you want to teach them. You guys ever heard that before? Awesome. Um, so we try to have teachers in the role of facilitator. Um, ST does a good job. They have a lot of um, facilitation type questions that they push out that you, you guide kids in. Instead of giving an answer to a kid, you ask them a probing question. Um, we probe all the time. It, 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 the art of a question in a classroom setting is profound. And there is a training for that for teachers to have that art. It's not necessarily um, a, uh, an innate thing in teaching. And a lot of times you'll see teachers who may ask questions with a really rote answer response. That's not a DOK level of questioning or quadrant D type of question. There's a lot to that. I, if you haven't, I'm sure a lot of you coaches over here know DOK or uh, rigor and relevance frameworks. Uh, but for me, facilitating is a lot of questions, not a lot of give and take of information. And they foster the softer skills of perseverance, that kids need to persevere while problem solving. Um, digital literacy, we let kids explore uh, technology and we give them opportunities uh, to tinker. Um, in elementary school, we call that exposure. They may not be necessarily creating the high level uh, products that a middle school or high school will get to, um, but the exposure to uh, technology um, and having uh, a play with it is great. And I'm not even talking about just a blended learning tool. I'm talking about Google, Google Drive or um, creating a Google Slide, that kind of stuff, especially at the elementary school level. Um, and then collaborative work. For me, in our building, the grade level teams are completely collaborative, and that trickles down to the, the classroom settings, too. So real quickly, I want to introduce where I'm at and where my school district's at. So um, we're in Pickerington, Ohio, which is 20 minutes southeast of Columbus. So we are right in the middle of Buckeye country. Um, I've actually got a couple of our former students that are playing for the Buckeyes, so that's kind of nice to see. Um, we are the 15th largest school district in the state of Ohio. Uh, we have 10,500 kids. Um, and we have 675 teachers, 200 educational aides, um, and we actually use ST Math all the way from preschool all the way up through eighth grade, every single kid. Not just RTI, not just support, every single kid is on ST Math uh, from 60 to 90 minutes a week. Um, ST Math is actually writing a case study on us. We've actually seen nine percentage points higher uh, than our counterparts that do not have ST Math on our state tests. So look for that case study, which should be out in a couple weeks or so. People in your region? Correct. Other Ohio schools close to us and similar to us in everything. Yep. So real quickly, let's talk a little bit of how we got to where we're at right now. Um, so when I took over the director of technology, I came from the curriculum office. We had absolutely no plan whatsoever for technology, nothing. It was, we have this amount of money. At the end of the year, we bought some iPads, we bought some laptops, and it just went wherever. We didn't really even know where it went to half the time. So I said, we, I, I can't operate that way. I can't work that way, and we're not seeing any change with it being that way. So we spent um, a whole entire year writing this um, uh, technology plan. It ended up being 130 pages long and it's got everything in it from connections to teaching and learning to connections um, with the curriculum and where everything aligns and what our goals are and so on and so forth. So at that website right there you can find that that plan. Um, but what we wanted to do was we wanted to figure out how do we really truly want to spend the money. All right. We knew that we had about $2 million a year to spend on actual technology stuff, um, another 500000 or so to spend on all the infrastructure side of things. So we really wanted to make this change. So we contacted a few people. Uh, we started in with the future ready process. 
If you don't know the group Future Ready, um, I would definitely look them up. They've got some really, really, really good frameworks of getting started on this plan. Uh, we actually won an award uh, because of our plan coming out and following their, their method and everything. We did some stuff through ISTE and all those types of things, and this is what allowed us to get to the process of going one-to-one. -one. But adding in just technology is not going to be the saving grace at all. All right, you can throw in as much technology as you want, it's not gonna make a change. What makes a change is having it linked to your curriculum and having your teachers properly trained and knowing what they're doing and feeling supported as they go through that whole entire process. So our, our big thing was, in the last 12 years, we've had six superintendents, all right? And every time a new superintendent came in, it was, here's what I want to do. And we had the next shiny thing and the next shiny thing. And our teachers had this philosophy where, just wait six months, it'll go away, all right? So we really didn't want it to be, this is a new thing or this is something else or, oh my gosh. So we created our own blend of digital learning or blended learning called Tradigital Learning. It's the blending of traditional best teaching practices along with the best teaching practices of a digital classroom. So what we did is we had teachers sit down and we just said, what are your best teaching practices from your classroom right now, before we put any technology in? We had some conversations about are those really, truly good, accurate practices? And then we introduced them to John Hattie and John Hattie's visible learning work and the barometers of influence and looking at, okay, are these things really, truly making a difference or is it just kind of things that you think personally they are? And there was a lot of heavy, hard conversations that we had to have about teaching practices. So along with that, we also created these other gears of blended learning that go along with the ideas that blended learning is going to affect every single thing that we do in this school district. It's going to radically change it all. So we're looking at the learning environment. What do the spaces look like? What does the instruction look like? How, does, how will teachers have to change adult practices that they do? What's the student learning look like? How do the kids have to change? How do their mindsets look different? Engage communities. What do we need from parents? What do we need from all the stakeholders to be able to accomplish this? What professional development do we need? We involve the one-to-one. -one. You do not need to do one-to-one -to, -one to make this work, but we did. And then the teachers had to have the instructional and technical support to be able to make this work. So along with the lines of John Hattie, I just want to introduce you to a couple things if you've never seen his work before. This is the barometer of influence that we looked at. We looked at a ton of these different things. And basically what he says is, he did a bunch of studies, correlated it down to figure out what teaching practices were best and so on. If you're here, this is actually has a negative effect. A couple examples of that is like retention, um, summer. Those are all negative effects. Here in the yellow would be if your kid never went to school. This would still learn these things. In the orange is a normal teacher, normal one year's worth of growth. And then here is everything above that. And this is where we really wanted to get to. So what are some things that we can do to get there? So one of the first ones is in every single classroom, the relationships is by far the most important. And one of the things we had was we had our classes were packed, all right? We were at 28 kids at the elementary school per class. We're at 32 kids at the junior high and high school. So the teachers are like, in 45 minutes, how can I get to know all of these kids? I can't. So blended learning and doing station rotation, I'm now working with groups of six, seven, eight, nine kids at a time. I'm getting to know those kids much better than if I taught to the entire class. One of the other ones is allowing creativity, all right? One of the things I hate when I go into a classroom and a teacher's like, everybody, you're gonna do a presentation today and everybody has to do a PowerPoint. Why does everybody have to do a PowerPoint, all right? Why can't they do a Prezi? Why can't they do a, a video? I had a teacher, when, when she finally thought about this, she goes, okay, I do this little experiment. We do a class pet every year, and the kids have to create something for a class pet. I'll, I'll be willing to let go of that one. That's the one I'll be willing to let go. And she said, tell me, using your Chromebook, somehow make something that allows you to tell me what class pet we should get. She got a kid that wrote a song. She got a kid that wrote a play. 
She got videos, all this really cool stuff. And she came to me and said, hey, you need to come in and see this stuff. And she looked at me after that was done. She goes, I never, ever, ever would have guessed that these kids would have been able to do that. So allowing for creativity is a huge piece with this. Problem solving skills. Our teachers are problem solving every single day now. Our kids are problem solving every day. One of the things kind of along with problem solving is, I know when I was a teacher, I would have to give directions a lot, all right? And one of the things now with Google Classroom is, we give directions once and we put it in Google Drive, in Google Classroom. Because if the kids don't get the directions, go take a look at Google Classroom. One of the things that Alice Keeler, I stole from her, was I use my words to impact teaching and learning, not give directions over and over and over again. So this has helped out with, with problem solving as well. Effective feedback, all right? We're able to give feedback so much better now than what we've ever been able to give, all right? Teachers aren't taking giant stacks of papers home with them. Everything's done online and everything's done right there. Teachers are able to get feedback right back to those kids the following day instead of maybe a week or so later if we'd have to do some stuff in, in paper pencil. The other thing to think about with our classrooms is, and when we go into a blended learning environment, you saw we had to move this room around a little bit, is do our classrooms look a lot different than this 17th century tapestry, all right? We still have, in some of our classrooms, a teacher standing up in front of the room, talking to all of these people, kids in the back falling asleep, kids not doing what they're supposed to be doing, and maybe we got a little intervention session going on up here in the front, all right? This can't happen anymore, especially in a blended learning environment. All right, how can we make this change? So my teacher started thinking, and what we did was we actually took this room right here, which was our old computer lab, and we gutted it. Because why do we need a computer lab if every kid has a Chromebook now? So we put a green screen wall on the back, which we'll talk about more here in a little bit. We put TVs on wheels, and we put flexible furniture all over the room. This then got the teachers thinking, the kids love this. This room is used like nonstop. The teachers then started thinking, well, what can I do in my classroom? The teachers started scouting out the building, like scavenging for, for furniture. What's in storage? What's not being used? They started writing grants. They started doing crowdsource funding for stand-up seats, all kinds of stuff. So we've got this classroom here. They took the legs off the desks, put the desks all the way down on the floor. They bought some lawn chairs, all right? One of the groups got a couch and got some other things. Also, teacher desks in, I would say, 90% of my middle school groups that we've worked with are gone. I love it. There's not that desk up in the front of the room that this is the front of the room. Half the time, you can't even tell where the front of the room is anymore. All right? So thinking about what the space looks like is also incredibly important. One of the other things that we did was um, we went one-to-one, -one, um, and with that, you don't really have to go one-to-one -to, -one to make blended learning work. You just need to have enough devices to do a station. So let's say you know, you've got 30 kids in your classroom. If you have seven, eight devices, that can be a station for you. I've got stations running in all of my buildings, including high school. I've got high school Algebra One teachers that are doing station rotation models, and it works. She came to me and said, I can't make anything happen because all of our top Algebra One kids take it in junior high. So she's got the lower math kids. How can I do this? They're all over the place. Do station rotation models. So it's incredible how these things have worked. So what are some of those examples of station rotation models? We usually have four. We usually start with three and then we go to four with our teachers. So one of them is the teacher-led station. One of them is the technology enhanced station independent practice, and then the other one is they're working together in groups on the four seats, all right? Along with this, the room has to have that shape to be able to make those rotations, and the teacher has to be able to be confident enough to be able to make those, those station changes as well. Can you tell me a little bit more about the four seats and what that actually looks like? It depends a little bit on each classroom, and it's a little different every single time because you're really working on these things. Most of the time it's group work and group critical thinking type problems. So maybe in like an Algebra One class, it may be the um, ACT problem of the day, something like that, where it's going above and beyond what we're looking at. The other thing we need to talk about is professional development. We cannot expect 
that these devices just go in and all of a sudden they're just going to make everything work, okay? We actually hired an embedded professional development folks and hired an instructional coach to actually work, uh, that's a blended learning expert, to actually work with our folks. So if your teachers don't feel that they're supported, that's not gonna work, all right? And we had to talk about some things because classroom management looks dramatically different, all right? So here are some of the examples that we did for, for classroom management. Red task, yellow task, green task. Red task, they have a big stoplight on the front of their room. There's a magnet that moves depending on what the assignment is. Red task, no Chromebooks whatsoever, put them away. Yellow Chromebooks, you can use them based on what the teacher is saying. And a green task is uh, you can use it for whatever you want, okay? Same thing for iPads as well. So we had to come up with some type of a parameter that the kids understood as soon as they walked in the room what they were doing. We've also invested heavily in virtual reality, so we're taking the technology beyond that. So sometimes one of the stations is virtual reality. Um, we've got a couple schools that are really, really low socioeconomic compared to the rest of the district. And their problem is, is we can't close the achievement gap because they have an experience gap. So one of the things in one of our uh, Eureka lessons is, is they're doing a thing on the oceans. All right. And in the oceans, we had one kid in one class that said he'd never been to the ocean before. So how can you have a discussion or ask the kids to write something if they can't figure it out? The other thing here, these guys right here, we have a green screen in all of our buildings now. And what we've done with this is the kids that are done, this is their Christmas project that they just got done doing. Um, but the kids that get done with, with ST Math early, one of the questions is always, what do you do with them? So one of the things that they're gonna be doing this year, and we've already started it, is they're actually gonna go back and green screen and act as they are GG to complete the math problem to actually work out what they have to do on some of those trickier math problems so our kids, you know, maybe kids that are struggling have some idea of what's going on and those types of things. And then lastly, the biggest thing is it's a process, all right? This is our three-year goal and this is where we wanna be at. At the end of this three years, we wanna be personalized and we wanna be differentiated. I've already got some teachers that are already actually already doing that. The different, the different groups are actually personalized and individualized based on pretest data. So it's pretty cool what you can actually do if you just start the process, give the training, and some of your high-flying teachers will take it beyond what you've ever imagined.